Good afternoon, Instructables.com. Uh, if you've been through my proof on how to use the definition of convergence to show that a sequence does in fact converge, uh, that's great. I hope that was really helpful. This video that I'm making right now uh, should hopefully give me the opportunity to better explain some of those things that might have been in there, like the K epsilon, the epsilon, if you're a little unfamiliar with what those are. I'm going to try to clear that up right now. I didn't want to do it in a big block of text because that can just make things a little more confusing. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to do an example up here with a little bit of a more complicated sequence than the one that was used in the Instructable to kind of show you how to look uh, look through those absolute values, look for those inequalities, um, and, and again, also to explain about that K epsilon and epsilon business. So this is what I have. I've stated my sequence up here, just like I did in, uh, in the Instructable. And my sequence, x sub n, has been defined to be n over n squared plus 1. Now, if you've taken any sort of calculus course, especially calculus 2, what you do already know is that this sequence converges to 0. We know that using calculus 2 tricks, we can look at the powers uh, when we're dealing with quotients here. But we're in 414, we're in real analysis. We don't really care that the sequence converges. What we care about is why. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to show why this sequence converges. So we're going to use the definition, which I don't have up here. Let me write that. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a k epsilon in the natural numbers such that if n is bigger than that k epsilon implies that x sub n minus l is less than epsilon, or l is our limit. So, stated my definition, I've stated my sequence, I'm going to start my proof. When you're starting any proof using the definition for convergence, the first step in any proof is let epsilon be given. So we'll start our proof. We let epsilon be greater than zero. If you recall from my instructable, step two was let that magic number k sub epsilon be greater than something. That's what we have to find. Now, this is a tricky part about this. This really tripped me up for a while, and now that I've had this course, has really helped me better understand what's going on. So let me try to explain this to you. We have some sequence here. In this case, it's nice. We have a defined sequence. We can find each number. We can find x sub 1 explicitly, x sub 2 explicitly, yada, yada, yada. What we're doing, what this definition is saying, is that we have a sequence of numbers, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. Actually, I'll just use dots. Okay, We have a sequence of numbers going somewhere. Now, here's what we know. We know this converges to 0. I'm going to call 0L for the sake of this little graphic that I'm drawing. Okay, you know, that, that, that. Here's my L. Epsilon, that Greek character epsilon, is used to denote a very small error range. Well, we usually say it's small. You can make it whatever you want. But the purpose of it is to be small. What we want is we want to know for any epsilon, let's say 1, I want to know how far in my sequence do I need to go before, let's say that this is 1. Let's say that this is one unit or one number or whatever away from L. How far do I have to go before, boom, I have an X sub N and every X sub N after that, N plus one, N plus two, N plus three. How far do I have to go before I'm within one of this L? Or let's say I had one half. Now how far do I have to go? So what the thing is, this one right here, that's our case of epsilon. What we're looking for is, how far do we have to go before we only need to go one more in our sequence to be within that epsilon distance of L? That's why we call it the case of epsilon, because it depends on the epsilon that we choose. Now, that's the tricky part. Since it depends on our epsilon, um, it can change. So remember that. When we're finding it, we need it to depend on epsilon. So this is what graphically kind of what we're saying. Now what we're going to do is try to write up a string of inequalities starting with our sequence to get our sequence less than epsilon. So we'll do some scratch work over here to find that case of epsilon. Scratch. We start with our absolute value, right? n over n squared plus 1 minus our limit, which we claimed was 0. Actually, let me write that up over here. Again, we don't care that it converges, we care y. Minus L, minus 0. What is this less than or equal to? We can't just say epsilon yet. We don't have a case of epsilon, we don't have any. We got some n's, but we don't know what case of epsilon is. So we can drop our 0, because it's 0. Also note that n is a natural number. 
So n is always positive, and n squared plus 1 is always positive, so we can drop these absolute value bars. Sometimes they trick us up, so we don't really want them in here uh, if we don't need them. Now comes the part of looking for numbers, looking for inequalities, to get to a spot where we can pick our case of epsilon, because we can just kind of find it. So we have this. I'm going to come down here. What's something that this is less than or equal to? Well, when we're dealing with quotients, we want to make the top bigger when we're moving this way, or we want to make the bottom smaller. So how about we just make it n over n squared? The reason I chose this is because if you were to look at, let me draw it up here. n over n squared is obviously greater than n over n squared plus 1. You can easily verify this. You know, cross multiply. If n cubed is less than or equal to n cubed plus n, obviously true, because you'll get n greater than 0. By definition, that's a fact. Now we can simplify this. 1 over n looks familiar, right? Exactly like what we had in the instructable. And that's okay. A lot of times when you're proving convergence, you're going to end up with something like 1 over n, or 1 over n squared, or 1 over n plus 2, or something. Those are great. We need n in the denominator, because that's what allows us to find our case of epsilon. So now that we have a very, very simple expression, 1 over n, one over k sub epsilon. There it is. We found our 1 over n, found our 1 over k sub epsilon, we make this less than epsilon. Now if we leave left to right, if we read left to right, we have that the absolute value of our sequence minus our limit, less than, equal, less than, equal, less than, less than epsilon. Perfect. That's what we needed. We don't switch our inequality anywhere. We don't only have um, less than or equal to's. We get a strict inequality, and that's what we need for our proof. Strict inequality. So we keep all that. Everything's great. But there's one question that we have to ask ourselves. How do we know that this case of epsilon is a, is a number? How do we know this exists? Well, if you recall from the instructable, we use what's called the Archimedean property, which you should be familiar with. The Archimedean property states that for any real number, say x, there exists an n in the natural numbers that's bigger than that x. So we have that 1 over k epsilon is less than epsilon. Quick algebra, 1 over epsilon is less than k epsilon. Again, we know this is true by the Archimedean property. Can't really spell Archimedean, so I'll just leave it as arc. As epsilon gets smaller and smaller, because again, it's going to denote some really small error range, 1 over epsilon is going to blow up and get huge. That's okay, because by this Archimedean property, we know there's always a k epsilon bigger than that number. So perfect. This is what we have. So this is what we need. Or this is what we need. I apologize. Now we come back up to our proof. We found k sub epsilon. We need it to be greater than 1 over epsilon. Now we can just finish our proof. Now, uh, let epsilon be greater than zero, k sub epsilon bigger than epsilon, then. If n is bigger than that k sub epsilon, implies that the absolute value of our sequence minus our limit zero is less than epsilon. We just use the definition to show that this limit converges to exactly what we claim it converges to. One more thing you want to say when you're finishing up this proof, just to be nice and neat, is you can say, by work below or to the side or above. You want to make sure you reference this scratch work somewhere so that whoever's grading your paper or whoever's reading your paper knows that you didn't just pull this case of epsilon out of thin air, that you actually got your hands dirty, you did some algebra, and you found it. I hope that this helps clear up any misconceptions about what the limit is, about what case of epsilon is, about what epsilon is, and about how to find our case of epsilon through these algebraic inequalities. Thank you.